In the early 1920s, North Africa's Rift Mountains witnessed a long and bloody anti-colonial struggle by the Amazigh peoples. Armed with modern weapons, religious fervor, and a newfound sense of nationalism, the Rifi fighters inflicted heavy defeats upon their would-be Spanish colonizers and proclaimed an independent republic until France intervened. The Rift War would go on to become a part of Amazigh identity and would shake Spain to its core sparking the rise of one of Europe's longest reigning dictators. By 1904, European powers had divided and taken control of the territory of present-day Morocco. France controlled most of the region and left a weak sultan as the nominal head of state. Spain took a much smaller strip of territory along the coast around the Spanish enclaves of Ceuta and Melilla. In 1912, France imposed a protectorate on its area and allowed Spain to do the same as long as the Spaniards kept the German influence out. Spain's government initially paid little attention to its Moroccan possessions. After the First World War, however, Spanish attention was drawn by rumors of mineral wealth in the interior and Madrid's desire to recover some prestige after defeat in the Spanish-American War of 1898. But the Spanish authorities had little information about the remainder of their colony. It was covered by rugged, arid, mountainous terrain populated by numerous Amazigh tribes, the largest and most powerful of which was the Banu Wariahal. These tribes had already clashed with the Spanish on at least two local campaigns since the 1890s. Their lands centered on the Rif Mountains, a region many outsiders considered violent and plagued by tribal blood feuds. In reality, though, clan infighting was kept relatively in check by a system of fines. At first, Spain tried to extend its influence in the tribal areas by political means, especially based on the payment of pensions. This was partly because of the strong Spanish left, especially in Catalonia, who opposed military occupation and led protests against conscription. Meanwhile, Spanish officials worked with Rifi notables like Abd al-Karim al-Khatabi, also known in Europe as Abd el-Krim, or among the Amazighs as Mule Mohant. El-Krim had been educated in Spanish schools and originally favored Spanish rule over the French. By 1918, though, he turned against his Spanish employers because of their corruption and prejudice. In 1923, he described this change of heart to his fellow Rifians. I served with the Spanish, and I discovered that misfortune had come down on our land from above when they came into it. Let us dedicate ourselves to rescuing ourselves, our people, and our land. In 1920, El Crim's clan revoked their allegiance to Spain and began organizing anti-Spanish resistance in the Rif. He called for an independent Rif, and he would soon become Spain's worst enemy in North Africa. So Spain had tried a policy of political penetration in the Rif, which had failed and led to Amazigh resistance. In 1919, the new Spanish High Commissioner, General Damasco Berenguer, decided to deal with the rebellious tribes by force. The Rif rebellion against Spanish rule was not limited to El Crim. In the west, around Jbala, tribal leader Mulay Ahmed al Rasuni also opposed Spain and reached out to El Crim for help. A poor harvest and tribal animosity, however, prevented serious cooperation. By October 1919, the Spanish defeated al Raisuni but failed to capture him. New Spanish commander Manuel Fernández Silvestre had a reputation for recklessness, but despite the concerns of High Commissioner Berenguer, Silvestre could act freely since he was a favorite of the king. In May 1920, Silvestre called for and received permission for an offensive into El Crim's territory. About 20,000 Spanish and 5,000 allied Moroccan troops entered the region. They met with little resistance as the lightly armed Amazigs retreated deeper into their own territory. In the interior, El Crim began to organize a bureaucracy and army for his movement, inspired in part by Turkey's Mustafa Kemal. By early summer 1921, the Spanish had advanced 128 kilometers and reinforced their control by building a system of 144 blockhouses. These blockhouses were not an effective defense, though. They were isolated from main roads and sources of water, and the living conditions and morale of Spanish troops were poor. Officers often went absent, leaving their men to suffer at their posts. 
Berenguer told Silvestre that the Spanish were overstretched and El Crim might attack. In fact, El Crim warned the Spanish not to cross the Amerkan River. Silvestre was unimpressed. This man, Abd El Krim, is crazy. I'm not going to take seriously the threats of a little Berber Qaid whom I had at my mercy a short while ago. His insolence merits a new punishment. Spanish troops had taken part of the Rif, and on June 1st, they crossed the Amrican River and established a new base at Abaran. What they did not know is that they'd walked right into a trap. El Krim's warnings to the Spanish had been serious and his retreat was a ruse. Amazigh fighters attacked the new Spanish base at Abaran and Spanish-led Moroccan troops mutinied. The Spanish abandoned their position after suffering 179 killed. To El Krim, the victory at Abaran was a rallying call to the other tribes of the region. The Spanish have already lost the game. Look at Abaran. There, they've left their own dead mutilated and unburied, the souls vaguely wandering, tragically denied the delights of paradise. In July, the Amazighs launched attacks all along the Spanish line. They besieged the 300-man Spanish garrison at Igariben, which soon ran out of water. Stories emerged of soldiers drinking cologne, vinegar, and even ink to stave off dehydration. Eventually, the fort fell, with only 25 survivors. The Spanish made a general withdrawal, with many units converging on the fort at Anual. Silvestre arrived on July 21st to take control of the situation, but was immediately overwhelmed. Eyewitnesses claimed that he compulsively chewed his moustache and asked practically everyone what he should do. As Rifi tribesmen began to fire into the fort, he ordered a retreat, which soon turned into a rout. Spanish soldiers fled in all directions in what one survivor described as, quote, a human avalanche. Those who escaped the fort were picked off by Rifi marksmen or ambushed by Amazigh swordsmen. Silvestre's fate is not clear, but an eyewitness claimed that he was seen on the battlements screaming, Run, run, the boogeyman is coming! Whether Silvestre was killed or committed suicide is still debated but El Krim was later seen wearing his sash. Although the larger Rift tribes had started the attack, many others, most without firearms, also joined in as the fleeing Spaniards crossed their territory. Airmen who flew over the area reported seeing the countryside strewn with Spanish corpses. At Sidi Dris, only five of the 500 strong Spanish garrisons survived, while at Monte Arrit, the Spanish attempted to make a stand. The garrison surrendered there on August 9th, whereupon Rifi tribesmen massacred them. On other occasions, El Krim's fighters followed his orders to treat Spanish prisoners well. All in all, Spanish casualties might have been as high as 20,000. Now the Spanish town of Melilla seemed to be under threat as well. Spanish commanders sent a rising star in the military named Francisco Franco of the Spanish Foreign Legion to protect the town. The Legion had been formed in 1920 and earned the nickname Death's Betrothed for its ferocity. Writer Patrick Turnbull described the Legion's attitude. The Spanish Foreign Legion is comprised of men who, for various reasons, have no future, nothing to live for, but who wish to take a savage revenge on life before dying. There is something akin to the Japanese in their indifference to death, though the Spanish Legionnaires face it with a cold, individual contempt, as though death were something to be spat on disdainfully in its acceptance, rather than the hysterical emotion born of overcharged nationalism. Despite its name, however, most of the troops of the Spanish Foreign Legion were actually Spaniards. Once they arrived in Morocco, Franco took credit for saving Melilla, even though the city was never in serious danger. So El Krim's Amazigh forces had defeated the Spanish at Anual, but he did not intend to move on Melilla. Instead, he turned his attention to building a new Rifi state. El Krim was not interested in leading just another disorganized tribal uprising. His goal was to create an independent Rifi state, or as he put it, a country with a government and a flag. With the prestige and Spanish weapons that he gained at Anual, he intended to create a nation-state and a regular army. Traditionally, the Rif tribes defended themselves with harkas, informal bands of fighters recruited in town market squares. 
Now, El Krim and his staff, including European educated technocrats, reformed the army along modern lines with organized units, uniforms, and salaried soldiers. In reality, though, the regular army was always quite small, consisting of only about six to seven thousand men. However, it did add to El Krim's legitimacy and authority. And authority was important. Although the tribes united against the Spanish, they were still divided. Some tribal leaders resented El Krim's central authority, while others distanced themselves from him after Anwar. To them, they defeated the Spanish and could now go home. In 1927, El Krim reflected on this attitude. Even those of the greatest knowledge and intelligence believed that after the victory had been won, I would allow each tribe to return to complete freedom, despite their realization that this would return the country to the worst conditions of anarchy and barbarism. El Krim tried to draw the tribes closer by sending appointed officials to villages to introduce reforms like taxation, road construction, creating a telephone system, and nationalizing production. Some tribes resented the changes, especially taxation, so El Krim's new regular army repressed opposition. All the same, the Rif state did provide some stability, as Swedish journalist Alexander Langlet observed. Abd El Krim's authority seemed to be absolute, and his laws, for example against tribal and family feuds, seemed to be kept. You can sleep on the road in the Rif, which you can do neither in the French nor in the Spanish zone. El Krim also understood the value of propaganda. To Europeans, he spoke of the modern aspects of his state building and downplayed the religious aspect, telling them that, quote, we no longer live in the Middle Ages. But he also knew his own people were devoutly religious. His government often framed the conflict with the Spanish as a jihad, and El Krim downplayed the modern side of his vision to local followers. His dual approach is clear in a letter meant to be read aloud to the Rifians. Mujahideen, through God's will, we have declared war on the Christian Spaniard and have thrown him out of our beloved land, blessed by the Prophet. Our victory must be completed by the total expulsion of the Christians. To that end, jihad has been called throughout the Rif. You must not make war, sons of Muhammad, like bandits. We must go to battle in an orderly fashion, beneath a flag. Just how much the Rif people supported El Krim is hard to judge. Although his own tribe stood by him, others hedged their bets, sometimes cooperating and sometimes refusing. As the people of the Rif began to build a state, their Spanish enemies became more divided. The Anual disaster caused a shock in Spain, made worse by the king's allegedly callous attitude towards the deaths of working class soldiers. Spain's already tense politics got even more polarized. Despite the annual defeat, the Spanish soon recovered much of the lost territory. They expanded from Melilla in late 1921, and by April 1922 had advanced 75 kilometers. The Spanish now had armored cars, aircraft, and a healthy sense of caution, though the Rifians rarely contested the advance. A major battle did take place at Tizi Aza in November, which cost 2,000 Spanish and an unknown number of Amazigh casualties. But Spain lacked the resources and the political will to take the heartland of the Rif. Instead, they resorted to aerial bombing of Rifi villages, including the use of poison gas. In March 1922, a new government was formed in Spain, the eighth in three years. Although pledging revenge for Anual, it was crippled by an economic crisis and political factionalism. The Moroccan colony was costing half of Spain's expenditures, and Spanish anarchists and socialists celebrated El Krim's humiliation of the Spanish military that they despised. But even the military mostly wanted to leave the Rif. The Spanish officer corps was divided into two camps. The Abandonistas, often represented by an officer's association called the Juntas de Defensa, wanted Spain to leave Morocco. The Africanistas, led by officers who volunteered to serve in North Africa, demanded victory over El Krim. Eventually, Franco and the Legion became the face of the Africanistas, even though Franco himself had occasionally flirted with the Abandonistas' position. Career prospects also worsened the split. Abandonistas resented the rapid promotion of younger, less well-educated officers who'd served in Morocco. A popular saying highlighted the issue. 
Officers were said to earn one of two things from their time in Morocco, la caja o la faja, the coffin or the general's sash. The result of the schism was a lack of any coherent Spanish strategy in Morocco and the Rif. Madrid tried non-military solutions. They made a deal with al Raisuli, and they went against Spanish officers' advice and paid El Krim a large ransom for 326 Spanish prisoners. El Krim used this money for his army. In February 1923, a Spanish civilian governor replaced the military governor in Morocco and began negotiations with El Krim. The Spanish offered autonomy, but the Rifi leadership insisted on full independence for what it called the State of the Rifian Republic. By August, Spanish troops were mutinying in the ports and riots broke out in Catalonia. General Miguel Primo de Rivera made his move, and after declaring martial law in Catalonia, he went to Madrid and deposed the government in a bloodless coup. The general argued that the civilian government had committed, quote, treason on the home front and promised what he called a prompt, dignified, and sensible solution to the Rif War. King Alfonso gave him permission to form a military directorate. So General Primo de Rivera ruled Spain, but he had to walk a tightrope between the military factions. Gradually, he changed from an abandonista to favoring a defensive line in Africa. Then, he announced a state of war and created an army reserve. All the while, the Rifi state was growing. In late 1923, Spain focused its attention in the east of its North African possessions, establishing a new defensive line around Melilla. The Rifi state, though, turned to the west. Since early 1923, El Krim had been extending his influence over the tribes of Gumara and Jbala. Progress was not always smooth. Gomaran leaders were reluctant to surrender their authority, and al Raisuli's continued presence blocked Rifi penetration. However, by September, much of the West was under Rifi control. In June 1924, Rifi forces increased their attacks against the Spanish in the West, especially towards the important Tetuan Shawen Road. Primo de Rivera explained the threat to the isolated garrisons. The reality was very sad. From Tetuan to Shawen, not a simple garrison or simple detachment could be normally provisioned. More than 25,000 men with their cannon, machine guns, rifles and munitions were the quarry which the enemy now had for his own. There was no time to lose if the situation was to be saved. Spanish command ordered its garrisons to hold out, but the Rifis captured one after the other. In July, the Africanistas made it clear to Primo de Rivera that his passive strategy was not working. With rumors of a new coup emerging, they demanded action. British Consul General Andrew Ryan recalled the tensions. The army of occupation, judged even by Latin standards, more nearly resembles a Greek debating society in its passion for politics than a fighting instrument. Internal criticism is freely indulged in, and its energies are dissipated in advocating this policy and condemning that. Eventually, to appease the Africanistas, Primo de Rivera ordered only a limited withdrawal in the West to the new Primo line. In September, Rifi troops attacked one of the key positions in the line, the fort at Shawen with its 3,000-man garrison. On the 23rd, 40,000 Spanish soldiers, including the Legion, set out to fight through enemy territory and relieve the garrison at Shawen. It took the Spanish column six weeks to travel the 40 kilometers to Shawen, often in terrible weather conditions. The Rifis allowed the garrison to leave the city before attacking in late November. They sniped, ambushed, and harassed the Spanish column the entire way, much to the frustration of Spanish officers who spoke of fighting against shadows. Spanish soldier Arturo Barea later wrote of the trauma in his autobiographical novel. The Moors got all those who didn't duck quickly enough. It took us four hours to get to the bottom of that ravine, and two hours to climb that other slope until we were in open country. It was the worst butchery I've ever seen. The Spanish army limped back into Tetuan on December 13, 1924, after the loss of up to 17,000 men and one general. Shawen was in Rifi hands, and when tribal leader al Raisuli lost control of his tribe to a rival in January 1925, El Krim's Rif Republic reached its peak. So the Spanish had suffered yet another defeat at the hands of the Rifis, whose state was growing stronger. 
but the expansion of the Rifi state drew new and powerful forces into the war. Until 1925, El Krim was careful not to provoke the more powerful and experienced French forces in Morocco. French military governor Hubert Lioti wanted to keep his distance as well, and some French administrators watched El Krim's victories over the Spanish with satisfaction. However, by December 1924, the mood was shifting. Lioti spoke of an imminent Rifi attack. Nothing would be so bad for our regime in North Africa as the installation near Fez of an independent Muslim state, modernized and supported by the most warlike tribes, with a morale exalted by success against Spain. In short, the most serious kind of menace, which should be dealt with at the earliest possible moment. Around the same time, El Krim also began to adopt stronger language. I recognize that the French have given Morocco order, security and economic prosperity, but I shall bring the same benefits with the further advantage that I am a Muslim. Although El Krim used the language of religion, his shift was actually pragmatic. In May 1924, French forces, made up largely of Senegalese and Algerian troops, crossed the Ouarga River to stop the Beni Zerwal tribe from falling under Rifi influence. This area was the Rifi breadbasket and home to many of their own fighters. Pressure was building on El Krim to attack the French. Some Rif leaders were convinced that their successes against the Spanish and their religious convictions meant victory against all Europeans was inevitable. A Rifi official calling El Krim the true Moroccan Sultan expressed his confidence to journalists. The Sultan can defeat all enemies in battle. The Sultan has many millions of fighting men who will sweep the French and the English and all the Christians out of the Arabs' country. When the Sultan has driven the Spanish into the sea, he will go to Spain and drive them out of there too. Spain is an Arab country. The Rifi will kill until he is tired, and he will take all the rest prisoners. Although El Krim would later distance himself from concepts of jihad, many of his followers still saw the struggle in religious terms at the expense of geopolitics. And so, on April 13, 1925, the Rifis launched a carefully prepared assault against the French positions. Rifi forces assaulted a French defensive line of 66 blockhouses on a 120-kilometer front. The blockhouses were meant to defend against light arms, but the Rifis had captured artillery and machine guns weapons that helped them capture 43 of the French fortifications. Only the successful French defense of Taza saved the French line from total collapse. Still, the line was breached and around 4,000 Rifi fighters broke through, removing the pro-French leaders of the Beni Zerwal tribe. Lioti announced a withdrawal on May 26th and called for reinforcements. On June 5th, El Krim captured Biban, the gateway to Fez. By this point, around 2,640 French troops had been killed. Rumors spread that El Krim intended to march on Fez, but he did not. With the Rifi army fighting both France and Spain, the two colonial powers decided to cooperate. French General Lioti was no fan of the Spanish, though, so Paris replaced him with famous First World War Marshal Philippe Pétain. With more flexibility than his predecessor, Pétain quickly established a cordial relationship with Primo de Rivera, although his first reports were not optimistic. The brutal fact is that we were unexpectedly attacked by the most powerful and the best armed enemy that we have ever met with in our colonial campaigns. El Krim probably launched the attack to force France and Spain to negotiate, and at first it seemed to work. The French and Spanish offered autonomy, but refused to recognize the Reef Republic. El Krim rejected the offer. The French and Spanish now decided on military action. There would be no unified command, but they would launch mutually supporting offensives. Both colonial powers rapidly reinforced their armies, with French forces increasing to 142,000, including armored cars and FT-17 tanks. Spanish forces grew to 200,000. Despite the exaggerated claims of Rifi leaders, Amazigh troop numbers were low, just 3,000 on the entire southern front. 
In early September, the colonial forces went on the offensive. On September 8th, Spanish troops, including Franco's legion, landed at Al Huthema's Bay, only six kilometers from El Krim's capital at Ajdir. Over 100 Spanish and French ships landed 16,300 troops, including a small number of tanks. The landing also involved sea-based air support, including aircraft from Spanish seaplane carrier Dédalo. The Al Huthemas operation is considered by many as the first amphibious landing involving tanks and mass seaborne air support in history. Although the landing was largely uncontested, the drive inland was much harder. It took Spanish troops 15 days to advance just two and a half kilometers. On October 3rd, they reached Ajdir and burned it down. On September 10th, the French moved towards the reefy heartland as well. In two days, they recaptured Beni Zerwal and in two weeks took Biban. Heavy rain then bogged down the troops and the tanks. Reefy tribesmen also developed tactics for disabling tanks and other vehicles at close range by firing and stabbing through openings. Despite the slowdown, the dual offensive threw El Krim onto the back foot. To make matters worse, there were severe food shortages in the Rif due to Franco-Spanish bombing and a lack of manpower for the harvest. Meanwhile, cheap food in the French and Spanish zones encouraged tribal leaders to move away from El Krim. Even within his own tribe, dissent was increasing. Final negotiations in May 1926 quickly collapsed. On May 7th, the Franco-Spanish forces continued their advances with a coordinated air and ground campaign deep into the Rif. By May 18th, they'd taken Anual and cut the Rif Republic in two. And by the end of the month, the colonial powers had decisively beaten the Rifi tribesmen. Some Rifis continued to resist until 1927, but for El Krim and the Republic, it was all over. On May 25th, El Krim surrendered to French officers to avoid likely execution if he fell into Spanish hands. Much to Spain's annoyance, the French allowed El Krim to go into exile on Réunion Island. He eventually escaped and died in Cairo in 1963. The Franco-Spanish victory in the Rif War was propagandized in Spain as the culmination of the Africanistas' long and bold struggle, despite the fact that French assistance was likely critical to victory. Although Primo de Rivera oversaw the victory, Franco benefited the most and he gained much prestige. He was soon promoted to Brigadier General, making him, at 33, the youngest general in Europe. Lioti would conclude what many in Spain were beginning to believe. Spain has only one man in Africa, Franco. The Rif War had ended Amazigh hopes for Rifian independence, but it made El Krim a hero in Amazigh memory, and his guerrilla tactics influenced later anti-colonial fighters in the 20th century. Despite Spain's ultimate victory, the war in the Rif was another step on Spain's path to an unstable future. The first ever landing with armor and seaborne aircraft might have happened in the Rif War, but the art of the amphibious landing reached its greatest scale and complexity in World War II, when the Allies made landings in practically every theater of the war. Even crossing a massive river like the Rhine in 1945 was a huge ground and airborne operation to successfully land Allied troops and tanks on the eastern bank. If you're interested in the Rhineland campaign, we made a three-hour series about Operations Plunder and Varsity called Rhineland 45. Unfortunately, we couldn't upload this documentary series to YouTube because our uncompromising portrayal of the Second World War would violate their content guidelines. Instead, you can watch Rhineland 45 on Nebula, a streaming service that we built together with other creators. On Nebula, you can watch exclusive content like Rhineland 45 or the Battle of Britain series from Real Engineering. You can watch all our videos there ad-free and earlier than on YouTube. Oh, and your Nebula subscription now also includes classes, where you can learn new skills from Nebula creators directly. Want to learn how to make a movie? Sit down with Patrick Willems and learn how. You can also learn more about law, the creator economy, traveling, and much more. If you want to sign up for Nebula, just follow the link in the video description or in the pinned comment below this video. With this link, you can get 40% off an annual subscription for just $30 a year. If you do sign up, you'll be directly supporting us to produce even more great history documentaries this year. We want to thank Mark Newton for his help with this episode. And as usual, you can find all our sources for the episode in the video description below. I'm Jesse Alexander, and this is a production of Real Time History, the only YouTube history channel that goes to war in an orderly fashion under a flag.